All right. Well, I've got my PowerPoint up here, so we'll go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about um, what it takes to make a complete mineral program for our cattle. All right, so why do minerals matter? Well, I hope that uh, Dr. Matthews has convinced you that selenium matters. And so um, when we look at, at all of our minerals, um, they really work to support a lot of the major processes that happen uh, in our cattle. And so they help not only with the digestion and metabolism of, of other nutrients like energy or protein or fat, but they can also help support growth, reproduction, uh, lactation and health. And so if you kind of think of those things as the big pillar um, of what we are asking our cattle to do for us, I like to think of minerals, especially trace minerals, as having sort of this supportive role. And so kind of thinking of them as, as like the mortar and a brick and mortar structure, um, they are a supportive role. They help in all those processes and those processes either wouldn't happen or wouldn't happen as efficiently uh, without the presence of minerals. But one of the problems with minerals is actually uh, being able to diagnose a, a mineral problem. Um, and that's because they can kind of hide from us in this whole gray area of subclinical mineral deficiencies. And so, uh, let me get my pointer up here. So this whole area over here is an area where you're not gonna be able to go out, take a look at the herd and say, yep, there's a, there's a mineral problem going on here. But while you're not able to go out and look at and, and necessarily diagnose that visually, there are um, potentially issues with immune function, giving up performance and growth, reproduction and lactation. And if it's in your entire herd, you may not necessarily notice those things. You may just think that it's uh, what your herd average performance is. It's not until mineral intake decreases and it's been down for a long enough time that we get over to this other side of this black line here into clinical deficiency that you're gonna be able to visually go out and observe issues with those cattle. And, I'm, and for me as a nutritionist, I'm worried about this left-hand side over here, subclinical uh, deficiencies and preventing that. Uh, that's where really where uh, our nutritional recommendations can keep you out of trouble. If your herd has gotten over here into clinical mineral deficiencies, it's probably out of my hands and it's probably an issue where you're calling your veterinarian. Um, so again, I like to try to stick over here and keep our producers from ending up in a clinical a deficiency type situation. So the other thing to think about minerals is that they make up a really, really small portion of, of the total diet of our cattle. And for a lot of our minerals, they have this a pretty safe area, margin, marginal area, um, where um, cattle can consume different amounts and they're not going to necessarily end up in a, a toxicity situation. Um, but I like to kind of think of minerals almost like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, if we have too little, uh, we're ending up with deficiencies. If we have too much, we can end up at, uh, in a toxicity situation. But when we're meeting our requirements for those minerals, that's kind of that happy medium there where hopefully we can keep those cattle out of that clinical deficiency range. In fact, when we talk about mineral requirements for cattle, um, those requirements are set to prevent deficiencies. They're not necessarily set to optimize performance, but they are set to prevent deficiencies. Um, based on what we currently know, we don't really have a lot of differences based on breed or sex or even stage of production. I have an asterisk there because um, manganese is one that we do have a different requirement for gestating and lactating females versus other classes of cattle. Um, but in general, this based um, basically based on differences in intake. And so there's a lot of room here where we, you know, we know that there are potentially some breed differences in mineral metabolism, um, but we don't know enough to make recommendations to say that if you've got X breed of cattle or Y breed of cattle, uh, you need to feed a different mineral mix. We're just not, not there in our understanding of that. And, and Dr. Matthews touched on this a little bit with selenium. And so I'm going to kind of expand that to uh, more of our minerals is uh, up on the top here, I've got the requirements for the different minerals. Um, and again, these are to prevent deficiencies. And then what I did is I took what I call book values for different common feedstuffs that we feed to cattle. And anywhere that you see a red 
uh, digit there means that the book value for that feedstuff is deficient uh, in that given mineral. And so you can see that for almost every mineral on here, there's at least one feedstuff that we commonly feed that is deficient. I will point out the only one that doesn't seem to have one is iron. Uh, and you can see that most of those are well above the iron requirement. And so that would be one mineral that I tell you, you don't need to supplement. So um, those numbers probably look pretty different to you than if you were to go pull out your mineral tag and take a look at that. Uh, so I wanted to explain a little bit of, of the math behind that. Um, so the mineral requirements are going to be based on total dietary intake. So for example, we'll take copper because it's 10 and that makes for some easy math. Uh, so 10 parts per million there or milligrams per kilogram. If we've got a 1200 pound cow consuming about two and a half percent of her body weight on a dry matter basis, that's gonna be about 30 pounds. Convert that over to kilograms, that's 13.6. And if we multiply that 13.6 times that 10, we get 136 milligrams of copper that that animal would be consuming. So when we look at free choice minerals, those are gonna be a lot more concentrated which is why you've got the bigger number because they're just going to try to consume that in as little as two or three ounces of intake. Uh, so at three ounces of intake and 1600 parts per million of copper, which is the copper that's in the UK uh, IRM cow-calf mineral, we see again, we get that same 136 milligrams of copper. So that's sort of how the math uh, is determined for those. So, I hope that we've driven home the point that supplementation is key. Um, but I don't want you to just go out and pick out whatever mineral is cheapest on the shelf because if it's not going to be doing an adequate job for you, you're just wasting money. So um, one thing to note is that not all of your feed analysis are going to include minerals, especially the trace minerals. So um, to say that you can just look at your, your feed analysis and, and pick and choose which minerals you want to supplement that's not gonna be very practical. Um, so uh, my general rule is to basically assume the feedstuffs have no minerals and then we supplement their requirement. Um, and this helps us uh, make sure that we're, we're taking into account any variability uh, in the uh, feedstuff concentrations um, across uh, the various feedstuffs that our cattle may be consuming. But amount is not the only thing we need to consider. Uh, Dr. Matthews did a really nice job talking about the differences in the selenium sources. That all has to do with this term bioavailability. And if you look at any uh, magazine that you pick up, there's probably an advertisement from company A saying their mineral is more bioavailable than this one. Um, and so that's kind of, a, it's a buzzword, but what it really means is how much of that mineral that we're feeding can be absorbed and then the key part of this is actually used by the animal. Um, so bioavailability can refer not only to our feed sources, so the minerals in say our hay or our forages, but also supplemental sources of minerals and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I also wanted to touch that forage bioavailability on minerals can be um, as low as just 50 percent. So when we were looking at that table with the red values, that was just total concentration and not taking into account forage bioavailability. So we may actually have even more need to supplement. Um, so the bioavailability though of these supplemental sources can also vary greatly. So it's important to know what you're looking at when you're picking out a mineral uh, at the feed store. So the first type of mineral we're going to talk about or source is inorganic. Uh, in general, oxides, um, so something that says copper oxide, for example, uh, is going to be uh, less available than things such as sulfates, carbonates, or chlorides. Um, this is a general rule that sulfates are going to be more bioavailable than carbonates or oxides. I will put one caveat in there that magnesium oxide is actually the standard form of magnesium that we supplement. But for our trace minerals, things like copper and zinc, this rule of thumb that if you're going to feed an organic, let's make sure at least that it's a sulfate. Um, just to kind of show some of this work, Dr. Kegley uh, back in the mid 90s uh, fed cattle either no supplemental copper, that's going to be the white circles, um, or copper oxide, which is the black circles, or copper sulfate, which is the triangles here. And they also fed 
molybdenum, which is another mineral. And basically what molybdenum does, if we feed it to cattle, it causes a copper deficiency. So they were trying to make these cattle copper deficient and they figured whichever source was able to maintain copper status or maintain the levels of copper, in this case in the blood, would be a potentially more bioavailable source, the better source to supplement. And so we see here that while the non-supplemented animals and those supplemented with oxide, they decrease pretty rapidly and that kind of continues all the way down to the end of their experiment here. Um, we can see that those supplemented with copper sulfate we're able to kind of hold on at this 0.8. And at 0.8 uh, milligrams per liter, those cattle are not deficient yet. So they were able to, to stay out of deficiency at that point. So what about organic or chelated minerals? These are gonna be minerals that are bound uh, to an amino acid. And I put can uh, have increased bioavailability. The literature is, is really hit or miss. And it's really because there's a lot of, of factors that go on. Um, and that can vary from mineral to mineral. Um, so again, I, I put that can in there just because to save time, um, there's a, it's a complicated answer. Um, these minerals will come with a cost and Dr. Matthews touched on that a little bit that we don't have a great understanding of what that is, um, but we do know that in general they will cost more. Um, so potentially having a mix of sources in your mineral mix may help keep the cost down uh, more than say feeding all of your zinc from an organic or chelated source. Some situations where I think this might be more important is when minerals um, are at risk of deficiency. So selenium is a great example. Copper would be another one. The other uh, example I have here is stressed cattle. And what I mean by stressed cattle, that's you know, cattle that potentially we've just weaned, we've put them through the sale barn, um, and maybe we've purchased them and brought them to our backgrounding operation. Um, those cattle are gonna tend to have uh, less feed intake. And so because of that, we actually have increased uh, requirements for stressed cattle. And it basically allows us to make the mineral mixes a little bit more concentrated, knowing that they're not going to consume as much feed. Um, so that might be one situation where an organic or chelated source can help you out. The other source I want to talk about is hydroxy minerals. Uh, these are minerals that are bound to an OH group. And what that does is it changes their chemistry. And that's important. It allows them to not be soluble at a neutral pH, which is what we find in the rumen. And so it allows it to get, th the rumen's actually a really hostile environment. There's all kinds of microbes going on in there um, and they're all competing for nutrients within that rumen. And so by not going into solution in that neutral environment, it allows the copper to escape and then uh, get to the small intestine where the cattle have an opportunity to absorb it and utilize it. So instead, these minerals, the chemistry of these minerals, allow them to go into solution in a more acidic condition, such as that found in the small intestine. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work done uh, looking at hydroxy minerals, and um, copper is one that we pick on a lot because we can actually have a pretty good way of measuring copper in cattle. Um, so uh, again, this is a source that can be more bioavailable compared to sulfates. Uh, Dr. Spears back in 2004 published some work and found that it was 196% um, more uh, bioavailable compared to copper sulfate. If so, if we set copper sulfate at 100%. Um, and then some of the work I did in my PhD at Iowa State, I found that feeding a hydroxy source of copper resulted in it being about 112% more bioavailable compared to uh, copper sulfate. There's also some other interesting data on hydroxy minerals um, having to do with uh, fiber digestion as well as mineral intake. Um, so NDF is a measure of fiber, and this is some work that was done in, in dairy cows fed either a forage-based uh, diet, which had corn silage and alfalfa silage, or a byproduct-based diet, uh, which had things like soy holes and beet pulp in it in addition to lower levels of, of silages. And so regardless of which diet these dairy cows were fed, if they were fed, if they were supplemented with zinc, copper, and manganese from a sulfate source, they had decreased fiber digestion compared to those cows that were supplemented with the hydroxy source. I actually saw some of the same work um, and so, uh, some of the same data in my um, PhD work, but in lambs, 
Um, we do know there's some species differences with, with mineral or with fiber digestion. So I wanted to make sure I showed you all something that actually came out of cattle, but um, we see this again in other ruminant species as well. Um, this sort of uh, improved fiber digestion with the hydroxy minerals. Uh, the other thing is mineral intake. Uh, so this is some work that was done um, in pre-weaned calves. And so uh, they basically fed these calves either um, a control uh, supplement that did not have the supplemental um, trace minerals or a hydroxy or sulfate supplement. So it either had the trace minerals coming from the hydroxy source or the sulfate source. Um, and what they found is that the cattle that consumed the hydroxy source actually consumed more of uh, the supplement that they fed. And this is total pounds over a whole 84 day period. Um, and while it's not statistically significant in this study, they actually saw um, this numerical improvement in, in body weight gain in these calves uh, fed the hydroxy source, which again probably has to do with this increased uh, consumption of the supplement that contain the hydroxy source. So choosing a, a trace mineral source. Um, limit products that are going to contain things like oxides or carbonates. Obviously one exception there is magnesium uh, oxide. That's going to be your standard form of supplemental magnesium. Um, sulfate, sulfate trace minerals for a lot of our our minerals are probably going to be adequate when we don't have a problem. So it's important that we identify minerals uh, that may require something like an organic chelate or a hydroxy source. And so uh, the two that I constantly harp on are going to be selenium and copper um, for our um, producers here in Kentucky. So what about form of supplementation? So this is how we're actually going to get it delivered to the animal. Uh, blocks. Um, the big thing about blocks is that this white block up here, it doesn't contain any trace minerals at all. So it's not going to help you meet that trace mineral requirement. The problem with the red block, while it does contain some trace minerals, is the cattle just can't consume enough of it to meet their uh, requirements. And that's because they just can't consume that much salt. Um, the other problem, I mean, and I put some of these other pictures up here because there's lots of, of blocks that are uh, advertised. There's companies that will formulate a block for you in whatever color, uh, however you want it formulated. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just the cattle cannot consume enough of the block to meet their mineral requirements. The other problem is that salt limits intake. So if we put out a free choice mineral mix that meets our, our that has salt in it to control intake, and then we have some other, another source of salt out there, if the cattle go and lick off that salt block, they may not be consuming enough of that free choice mineral mix that we put out there. So it's important to make sure that we're not um, combining multiple salt sources because uh, we may negatively impact trace mineral intake. So free choice mineral uh, supplement is going to be our best bet. We want one that's going to contain both the macro and micro minerals that our cattle have requirements for. Um, and the reason that we need to have all those minerals in there and they have to be formulated uh, specifically for cattle is when we look at this little mineral wheel over here, all of those lines are, represent a point at which multiple minerals interact with each other. And so one mineral can cause a deficiency of another. And so what we really need to do is make sure that, that we're buying a complete mineral product so that those things are all, all that formulation should be taken care of for you. Uh, so you don't have to worry about this whole mess over here. Um, but it's important that, that we read the mineral tax. Um, and I just want to touch on it a little bit that there are some other um, types of mineral products that, that you may be feeding at different times of the year or depending on the diet. And that might be like the high mag mineral uh, that we feed in the spring um, to prevent uh, grass tetany or a co-product balancer mineral, which is a mineral um, that helps us correct the, that inadequate calcium to phosphorus ratio that we find in a lot of our corn and corn co-product based diets. So what to look for when you're uh, looking at a mineral tag. First thing is whether it's a free choice mineral or a mixing mineral. A free choice mineral is meant to just be put out in a covered mineral feeder and let the cattle have access to it. A uh, mixing mineral, on the other hand, 
uh, would give you instructions for, for mixing that in with another carrier product. Um, and those are gonna have very different concentrations. So it's important to just look at that. The other thing that you wanna look at is your targeted intake. Um, that's going to tell you, um, this one, for instance, is three ounces per head per day. This uh, label goes a little bit further and tells you that that 50 pound bag is going to feed 20 head for 13 days. This is important because we need to keep an eye on our mineral feeders, not letting them run out. We may also be able to figure out that, hey, my mineral's lasting a lot longer uh, than it says that it should. And then we may have a palatability issue or something like that that we need to take a look at. Uh, so we touched on those different sources, and those are all going to be listed um, in the ingredients section. Um, and so I've got a couple examples of that here um, up at the top, uh, things like zinc sulfate or copper sulfate uh, being those inorganic sources. Um, and then we see things like zinc amino acid complex or copper amino acid complex, and those are those organic sources that we were talking about. Um, the hydroxy sources will read something like um, a hydroxy chloride, so zinc hydroxy chloride, copper hydroxy chloride. Um, that's how you know uh, the product contains that particular type of mineral. Um, I like to point out here, as we talked about some of those blends, these products here have both the copper and zinc coming from an inorganic source and an amino acid or chelated organic source. Uh, this is actually some data that uh, Dr. Matthews and uh, Dr. Burris's groups were involved with down here at Princeton. And what they actually found is this orange line here is the, sort of the targeted intake. And what they found is that pretty much any time of the year they looked at it, our cattle weren't consuming uh, their target intake. And that's on their own, own free choice. So we need to make sure that we aren't messing something up from a management perspective, leaving those mineral feeders empty, um, letting them get rained on um, and getting wet. We need to make sure that we prevent all of that from happening uh, so that our cattle have, um, at, can try to reach those targeted intakes. Um, this is just a table I put together um, based on the feeding rate of, a, of different minerals, so either two, three, or four ounces. And then looking at the herd size, this is how many pounds of product, mineral, you sh they should be consuming uh, in a given week. Um, and so you can see here that if you've got um, 25 head and you you've got a four ounce mineral product, you should about be having to replace that bag, a 50 pound bag, a, a little over, uh, you know, once a week. Um, so it's something that we definitely have to keep an eye on, make sure that we have enough mineral feeders out there and that cattle um, and calves have access to those. Uh, I touch on this a little bit just because there's a lot of other additives and products that go into mineral mixes just because it's a convenient way to provide them. Um, so things like fly control or medication like uh, chlorotetracycline for control of anaplasmosis. Um, and the reason I put that up there is really to drive home the point to not sacrifice the mineral quality for a non-mineral additive because there may be some other ways we can control some of those problems. Um, so again, don't give up the quality of the mineral mix just to add more stuff to it um, if, it's, if it's getting to be a, a budget concern. Um, mineral intake is gonna be the key to success for any mineral program, as well as the efficacy for any of those additives that might be in there. And of course, source and form are gonna be important. Um, a free choice mineral, uh, is, the, is the way to go um, versus something like a block or um, any other, or a tub or something like that. Um, and I put this out here, uh, the UK beef iron mineral specs, if you aren't feeding the UK beef iron mineral, that's fine. But if you're looking for a good place to start um, with what your, what your minerals should contain, um, you can do a quick Google search for those and they'll pop right up for you. And, and you can take that with you kind of as a, a guideline and a starting place. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you all might have. And I'm gonna unshare my screen here. Maybe. Katie, just in case it got buried a little bit. So uh, Irvin Yoder asked, are there any unique mineral requirements for developing bulls? <laughs> 
Any unique mineral requirements for developing bulls? Um, not necessarily uh, unique for developing bulls. Again, I'm going to just tell you that um, we need to have um, an adequate amount in there um, and that um, to meet those, those mineral requirements. And again, looking at things like selenium and copper um, potentially coming from a, a chelated organic source um, to prevent any deficiencies. Um, other than that, um, there's not necessarily a specific requirement for developing bulls. I, there are minerals that are important in bull development and, and in uh, male reproduction, uh, but as long as we're putting out a good high quality mineral, we should be meeting those requirements. And also there was one back in there uh, from Braven Likens asked, is there any research for reproduction? Uh, Dr. Matthews may want to touch on that. I also gave him, I put in there the YouTube uh, of Dr. Bridges and Dr. Anderson's talk to, to get the full spill. But uh, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to just give him kind of a, a brief summation of what you guys have found on the reproduction side. Sure. Um... The quick synopsis would be that the big take home message is the, you can increase our, our number of years and less has seen this outside of our herds that about a 10 to 20% increase in first service AI um, pregnancy and actual calves on the ground. And um, if you use the mix versus an inorganic form. And um, when you do the transcriptional analysis, kind of like we did for the other tissues, um, it would suggest that the reason is the CL is producing of the mixed cows is producing more progesterone because it has a greater capacity to take up cholesterol, which of course is the precursor for most of those steroid um, hormones. And so that's what the operating um, assumption is or model right now is that the mix is triggering that increased cholesterol transporter expression, allowing for a greater uptake of cholesterol in animals fed the mix. And this results in increased P4, which increases your um, efficacy of your first service AI. Um, we've also seen in one of the studies I alluded to that you've got when you feed mix to cows, their bulls at birth have a much different profile than if you're feeding only the organic and, or the inorganic. And it again deals with the sterogenesis pathway. Um, so that would be a quick synopsis. But again, it, Dr. Bridges lays that out pretty well in his talk of a couple of weeks ago. Yep, and if you uh, name pretty much any process, I can probably find a, uh, a role for just about any mineral in there for you. So um, yeah. my uh, take home is they're pretty, they're pretty much all important. Yeah. All right, well, if we uh, don't have any more questions, we appreciate you all sticking around tonight. Um, we are working on getting the YouTube video up from last week. Um, if you need the code for CAPE education for this week, it's Beach Selenium. And then join us next week, same place, same time. Um, Dr. Kyle McLeod and uh, Jeff Limkuhler are going to be uh, tag teaming next week for us. So again, thank you all for joining us and hope you all have a good night.